So I don't know if you heard, but you're, the EU is actually opening the borders um, this week, I think it was. Yes. Yeah, I did hear. And, and we're pretty dependent on surrounding countries um, for food and a variety of other imports. So it's not really something that we can stop, unfortunately. Muted. Government's been meeting with with the other governments to, to figure out what um, practices they can put in place to keep truck drivers safe. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, what we might do um, is that, so hi, everyone who is actually on the phone. That would be Yana that you're hearing discussing this, the pandemic situation currently in Rwanda. She is joining us from there. Uh, she elected to stay when uh, the borders were being closed because of the global pandemic. So we were just touching base with respect to some of the challenges and, and the successes that she's seeing there. I don't know. Um, so, so sorry about that, everybody. Um, just a reminder, please do put yourself on mute. I have done muting on my end as well, unfortunately, though, um, because Yana is calling in from Rwanda, uh, I haven't been able to mute everyone the same way I normally do. So um, I'm having to go in individually and mute everybody. So if you could help me out that way, that would be great as well. We are... Um, incredibly lucky that uh, despite the fact that it is monsoon season, she managed to get through. There have been a few issues this morning with the WebEx and signing in, so I know that probably there will be people joining us a little bit late. Hopefully we have managed to mute all of the beats this time round. If we end up having the same size group here, so there's only about uh, 15, 16 people so far signed in. What we'll do with question time is we'll just have like, a very open discussion and conversation. But if we end up having more than 30 people, then what we'll do is what we've done in previous weeks, where if you want to send either myself or Andrea your questions, then I will ask them of Yana when she's finished her presentation. So I am incredibly honored to introduce uh, a dear friend of mine. We were grad students together at the University of Saskatchewan, and we actually worked on projects that were fairly closely tied in together uh, on dogs up in the northern part of the province, working on different aspects, obviously. He is currently an assistant professor at the Center for One Health with the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. And so her research currently explores uh, what different One Health approaches to surveillance, socioeconomic burden, and the mitigation of neglected tropical diseases. And right now, snake bite envenomation, or snake bite, bites are considered to be one of those neglected tropical diseases that the rest of the world doesn't really consider uh, overly important, but obviously in a rural cultural setting, they can be incredibly devastating. And so she's working directly with healthcare providers, policymakers, and different communities to test out various solutions um, in order to help prevent those. So I'm going to turn it over to Yana to discuss with us. Um, the different knowledge and uh, reactions to human-snake conflicts that occur, and to provide a little bit of insight on some of the challenges in preventing those. Go ahead, Yana. Great, Jasmine. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I'm, I'm very excited to talk about some of our research on snake bite and venomation in Rwanda. And of course, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, Dr. Richard, who's a medical doctor at the University of Rwanda, Hilary Kinney, a veterinary student, and Professor Amagoni, who um, works at Vets, uh, the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University. 
So a little more about snakebite envenomation. As Jasmine said, this is really one of the most neglected tropical diseases in the world. It's a disease of poverty. Those who are impoverished are at highest risk. And once you are bitten, it very much contributes to the poverty cycle um, because of very high treatment costs and um, morbidity and mortality. So worldwide, approximately 5 million people per year are bitten by snakes. Um, of these, approximately 2.7 million are envenomed. 125,000 people die per year. And of these, uh, 400,000 people experience permanent disability. And Andrea, I'm sorry, I'm on slide two. I forgot to progress. So the permanent disabilities can include both amputation and blindness. Um, in addition to uh, mental health issues such as post-traumatic stress disorder, I'm sure you can imagine that being bitten by highly venomous snakes makes you very fearful about going back into the farm field to, to harvest your crops. Again, just a caveat, this is an NTD, so it's vastly underreported. Um, these numbers are really just estimates. Those at highest risk are rural and remote residents in tropical countries endemic for venomous snakes. And in particular, farmers and people involved in resource extraction are at very high risk because they work and they live in close contact with environments that are endemic for snakes. And lastly, children are at very high risk, partly because they're often um, in areas with lots of snakes, possibly barefoot, playing in fields. But once they are envenomed, their small body mass makes them at um, higher risk of mortality. The economic burden for people who are envenomed is really very high, and it's comparable to several other NTDs. It's estimated at 1 million disability-adjusted life years per year in sub-Saharan Africa alone. And this doesn't include the burden of animal deaths, which if you can picture a very rural farmer who might have a few goats, even just losing one of those goats can be very um, devastating for the family. And in particular, if you have to sell an entire herd to finance the cost of, of treating the envenomation event, it's extremely devastating for an entire household. Next slide, please. So venoms are a mixture of precoagulants, cytolytic and hemolytic toxins, neurotoxins, hemorrhagins, and biogenic amines. And, and the mixture is really specific to um, different snake species and causes a variety of symptoms that can include pain and swelling, tissue necrosis, uncontrolled bleeding, descending paralysis, even renal failure or death. And the prognosis, the the ability to survive the event and, and how a person survives the event is related to the venom dose, how many times a person is bitten, um, the snake species, of course, um, but very particularly the time and distance to receiving care. So from the moment a person is bitten, the clock is really ticking, um, and it's imperative that a person receives medical attention from a trained and well-equipped health center as quickly as possible. Um, there is a worldwide shortage of antivenom right now, and that has a huge impact on patient prognosis. And lastly, many people in sub-Saharan Africa prefer to go to traditional healers who offer a treatment called blackstone therapy. And this also delays um, a patient's uh, access to an evidence-based treatment such as antivenom. Next slide, please. So the country of Rwanda is a very small country in East Central Africa. It's home to approximately 12 million residents, the majority of whom live outside of Kigali City, which is the largest urban center. Approximately three quarters of people are engaged in agriculture, which can include cash crops and livestock. Um, and there are 13 medically important snakes in Rwanda. These include puff adders, as well as several species of mambas, cobras, vipers, boom slangs, and forest vine snakes. So we do have a variety of, of venomous snakes to contend with. Next slide, please. So the problem in Rwanda is that there is no current information about snake bite and venomation um, with regards to people or animals. So in this very preliminary study, our team sought to describe the demographics of snake bite and venomation victims who were seeking hospital care at the district and provincial hospitals. 
Next, we wanted to evaluate physician compliance to national guidelines for treatment. And lastly, given that there is a global shortage of antivenom, we wanted to assess antivenom availability at the hospital pharmacies. Next slide, please. So how did we do this? First, we needed to find our cases. So we sought all animal bite cases um, from the National Integrated Health Management Information System for the years of 2017 and 2018. Once we had animal bite cases, we had to go to each of the 40 district and provincial hospitals in order to determine the cause of the bite. Once we verified that a person was indeed bitten by a snake, we obtained uh, the paper medical files from the hospitals and extracted data related to demographics and treatment. And we used a 15-point checklist in order to evaluate physician compliance to guidelines. And lastly, we did a spot check of the hospital pharmacies, and we asked whether there was currently antivenom available and whether it had been ever available over the previous two years. Next slide, please. This map shows the distribution of hospitals in Rwanda. And so I hope it gives you a, an idea of how challenging it was to reach all of these hospitals in a, in a short period of time. Um, the, many of the records and registers were paper copies, which meant that Dr. Richard and his team had quite a task in order to identify all of the proper um, registers and, and case files. And if you look at the photo on the bottom left, you get an idea for where some of these files were located and why it was so difficult um, to obtain them. Next slide, please. So a few of our key findings. Um, our first objective was related to the demographics of people seeking care at hospitals. And overall, we found close to 4,000 cases of animal bites over the two-year period. The vast majority were caused by dogs at 78% and snakes at 14%. So snakes in Rwanda are the second leading cause of animal bites in people. We identified 363 cases. And when we looked at the demographics, we found the majority were women at 61%. We found that 65% were um, cases aged 30 or below. And this is really important because this is an age group that is very engaged in um, income generating activities and therefore critical for the economic well-being of the country. Eastern Province had the highest caseload and this makes sense because Eastern Province has a very different climate. It's more savanna like and it's far drier than any of the other um, provinces in Rwanda. Farmers um, were the, the largest group with respect to occupation, so 82% self-reported as farmers, and this is very much in line with other sub-Saharan African countries. There didn't appear to be um, a difference between season, rainy or dry season, so this is different from other sub-Saharan African countries. And the cases were um, equally distributed between nighttime bites when people were sleeping and daytime bites when people are more likely to be active and out in their fields. The vast majority of our cases at 93% had health insurance. So that was very good for them because it meant that um, the, the health insurance covered the cost of much of their treatment. In terms of bite location, the majority of patients had bites on their feet and legs versus hands, arms, head, and torso. And this is meaningful because it demonstrates that people were most likely bitten accidentally as opposed to um, picking up a snake with their hands or, or potentially even being bitten on their face. And this is what we see in other countries where people are more likely to handle snakes. Next slide, please. Our second objective was related to physician care. And I first want to emphasize that although we identified 363 cases of snake bite, that really is a huge underestimate and it can't be used to estimate incidents. We know that many people self-treat. We know that many people go to traditional healers. We also had ex extensive problems locating the patient records. Out of the records that we did find, there was high compliance for basic intake procedures, um, such as determining respiratory rate, blood pressure, heart rate, but there was low compliance for criteria that are considered critical for snake bite care, which are vitamin K, antivenom, and tetanus toxoid. 
Very importantly, we found no records where the severity of envenomation had been graded. And this is really important because if we don't know the severity of grading, we're unable to evaluate whether physicians gave appropriate care. Another important finding was that there was no medical record where the species of snake was identified. And this is significant because it doesn't allow us to determine whether the type of antivenom administered, if it was administered at all, was appropriate for that patient. Next slide, please. Our third objective was to look at antivenom availability at district and provincial hospitals. And there's two major take-home messages here. So first, we see the distribution of caseload shown by the blue, um, the blue bars across the different provinces. And we see, again, that the majority of cases occurred in Eastern Province and Kigali City. The three yellow stars designate hospitals where they had consistent antivenom availability over the two-year period. The six red triangles designate hospitals where antivenom was only sporadically available over the last two years. And all the other hospitals did not ever have antivenom available over the last two years. So what this figure really shows to us is that there's a problem with how antivenom is being distributed. In some cases, we have hospitals that have a high caseload with no antivenom. And in other cases, we have low caseload hospitals having access to antivenom. So we need to figure out how to redistribute the antivenom. The second take home message with this slide is that all of the hospitals with antivenom stocked the same product and it was a crotalidae polyvalent antivenom effective against a few different snakes including cobras, crates, russell vipers, and soft-scaled vipers. What's really important here is that that antivenom is not effective against all of the snake species um, that, are, that exist in Rwanda. So we have a problem with the type of antivenom that is being stocked. Next slide, please. So I think it's important with snake bite envenomation to, to talk about One Health solutions because this really is a perfect um, One Health problem. We have snake-human conflict, we have livestock being envenomed, and all of this occurs because of um, environmental factors that are bringing people and animals closer together. So how can we come up with cross-cutting solutions? I think the first important thing to talk about is that antivenom in itself, although it is the only treatment recommended to neutralize the effects of venom in people, also has a lot of drawbacks. Um, it can cause uh, serious side effects in patients, and the technology is almost 100 years old, so we need innovation. And I want to emphasize that snake bite envenomation, probably more than any other issue, is an issue of equity. The reason why antivenom hasn't been innovated is because the people who need it are extremely poor and often cannot afford it, and so this is not a good incentive for drug companies to redevelop antivenom. Um, the, the second issue is training for healthcare providers. So obviously we found in our study that we needed improved record keeping. Um, and we also observed gaps in patient treatment that needed to be solved. We saw in, in our last graph that there's a problem with antivenom distribution. And so what we're recommending is shifting to a hub and spoke approach. In Rwanda, we're very lucky to have a company called Zipline it's a drone delivery company that stores all critical blood products at a central location, which is the hub. And then when needed, it's able to very quickly transport those critical blood products to the spokes, which in this case are the hospitals. So we believe that adding antivenom to the hub in this case could do a much better job at distributing venom to the places where it's needed. The next innovation is, is one that maybe isn't so exciting, but bed nets and shoes are often low cost, even if many of our um, snake bite patients are unable to afford them. But they're effective against a wide range of, of NTDs. So shoes in particular are helpful against snake bites, but they're also preventative for soil transmitted helminths and podoconiosis. Bed nets are important because we saw that half of our snake bite envenomation cases occurred during the night, very likely while people were sleeping. So when used correctly, a bed net can be um, preventative against snake bites, 
but it can also be preventative against other NTDs like lymphatic psoriasis um, and malaria. Next, improved housing construction. So we need to make sure that people are not building homes directly in um, snake habitat. We need to make sure that people are not storing grain in their homes or, or very close to their homes. Grain and other agricultural products attract rodents, and of course rodents attract snakes. And so we really want to make sure that snakes are not being lured into people's houses. And lastly, we need to make sure that houses are impregnable. Um, that can be a very difficult task in a rural and remote community, but it's one worth striving for. And lastly, we need to protect snake habitat. Although this might be uncomfortable for some people who obviously don't want to be bitten, it's important to recognize that snakes play a critical role in ecosystem health, and they also prevent different types of human disease and ailments. Um, by ensuring that rodents don't become overpopulated and ensuring that rodents also are not um, devastating farm fields, thus um, contributing to malnutrition. Next slide, please. So how do we turn some of these results into community action? Our team has already met with policymakers at the Rwanda Biomedical Center who um, have a mandate for NTD control in this country. They were very excited about some of the ideas for improved antivenom distribution, um, improving medical curricula for medical students, um, and ensuring continuing education for uh, medical doctors who are already in the field. We are planning to have a stakeholder meeting um, when we're finally allowed to congregate again. And we have a variety of ongoing research projects, which includes tracing back all the patients identified in this project to evaluate their social and economic burden as a result of being envenomed. We are also looking at physician knowledge, attitudes, and practices because we want to learn more about um, the results that we saw in our evaluation of patient records. And lastly, we're hoping to embark on country incidence mapping, which will help us to pinpoint those areas where people are most being bitten which snake species are biting them, um, and what the country level incidence is. Next slide, please. So hopefully I've impressed upon you that snake bite envenomation really is a very important equity issue. Um, and for anyone who is interested in learning more about this information or learning the stories about some of these snake bite victims, I really encourage you to go to the Minutes to Die website and potentially even to watch their documentary or host a screening. And lastly, if we can flip to the last slide, I want to thank the Cummings Foundation who funds the One Health Collaborative, which is made up of researchers from the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University, the University of Global Health Equity, and the University of Rwanda. And I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Yana. That was phenomenal, as always. Um, we do have a small enough group this time around that after I ask my question, we will open it up to everybody else. So, Yana, when I was taking a look at your numbers with respect to the physician um, notes and that kind of thing, you said that there were 360-ish um, cases. But with the certain numbers, there were not necessarily all 360 were reported. So, for example, nighttime versus daytime, I think there were 120 cases where it actually reported that. Did you have the same difficulty in looking at the case reports as we have here, where uh, physicians don't necessarily answer all of the questions? And so, that made it a little bit more difficult to actually do some of your analysis? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. So we certainly saw some, some major problems with record keeping. Um, sometimes we were unable to locate files, um, but more often the case was that the particular information that we wanted that should have been there wasn't there. And so that was definitely a barrier to, um, to our analysis. Okay. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask?
I have one. So if, uh, <clears throat> I wondered, um, yeah, if on your presentation you showed that the larger number of those 300 and some cases had health insurance and a smaller number did not. And I'm just wondering if that's just because the ones with health insurance are the ones that actually showed up at the hospital. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point. So of course I can't I can't tell you if that was directly the case. Um, I will say that the majority of people in Rwanda, and I, I think the numbers around 80% of people here have community-based health insurance. So Rwanda has a really special system of providing health care, and it starts at the village level with community health workers um, and then goes to health posts, health centers, um, hospitals, and then finally referral hospitals. And so People are very, very strongly encouraged to sign up for health insurance, um, and the government has tried to make it as affordable as possible. For those in the very lowest income bracket, um, I believe their CBHI, their community-based health insurance fees, are waived. So if you are in Category 1, which is considered kind of the poorest of the poor in Rwanda, then you don't actually have to pay. So that's something that's very promising for, for these snake bite victims. I will say that probably a bigger deterrent to actually going to the hospital is probably distance, how to get there. Certain times of year, some roads can be impassable. And for some people, the cost of transportation to get to a hospital could actually be higher than any of the hospital fees. Um, and so there are a variety of uh, very important challenges for people actually making it to a medical center. And then as you saw from the data, many of the medical centers um, don't even have the antivenom on hand. Okay, so there are a couple people who do have questions. Um, you need to press star six if you want to unmute yourself, as well as unmuting on your own phone. Hi there, it's, uh, it's Krista. Um, I, I do have a question on, on the different kinds of snakes that they have there. Um, so they, they are not recording um, the species of snake when they bring um, or when they treat the patients. But yeah, it would have been very interesting to know, I mean, those mambas with um, neurotoxic, like the black mambas, they would not have much time to actually transport the people to the hospital in time for treatment. And then, um, yeah, um, so you have no idea what percentage um, of uh, snake bites are attributed to the different species of snakes. Yeah, thanks for that question. You are absolutely correct. So I believe we had one or two medical records that said black snake or black long snake, um, but none of them actually identified the snake. And, and it's very possible that people don't know the names of the snakes or that the physicians aren't thinking about asking and actually recording that information. And you're absolutely correct that with certain types of snakes like black mambas and green mambas, you have very limited time to get to the hospital for treatment. And I think that's one of the problems or one of the reasons why countrywide incidence mapping is so critical. Um, we sense that probably many of these cases don't make it to the hospital. And so we are hoping to undergo a, a community-based surveillance approach where we can actually go into communities and figure out how many people are bitten, regardless of whether they're going to the hospital, a traditional healer, a pharmacist, whether they're treating themselves, or maybe they don't make it to any sort of health worker. So that's a really important and major next step. Um, it would be extremely valuable to get more information about the snake species because, as you said, um, you know, it impacts whether a person can make it to the hospital, and it also impacts um, which antivenoms should be stocked at hospitals and where. Yes. Thank and you. Anna, just a great, great question, Krista. There's just a, a follow-up question to that. Um, did you do a comparison of, of 
the case fatalities, so uh, reported mortalities due to snake bites in comparison to treatment. Yeah, thanks for that information. And um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get information on um, case fatality because that's stored in a different system. So that is a major limitation to this preliminary study, and it is something that we are hoping to enumerate in this countrywide incidence mapping. Okay, great. Um, we did start a little bit late, so if anybody's able to stay, we do have time for another couple of questions. Don't forget, if you want to unmute yourself, it's star six. Did everybody already ask all their questions or are people still talking and muted? Okay, well, if there are no other questions, do you remember that if you had questions but weren't able to actually get them through that you can email them to me and I'll send them on to Yana and compile them and send their responses back. But we would really like to thank you, Yana, for joining us. Um, I know it's, it's after work for you there in Rwanda now, so uh, go and have a really good dinner and pat yourself on the back. You managed to get through despite the monsoons. And we look forward to talking with you again soon. Um, next week, we are going to hear from Dr. Robin Lindsay and Dr. Sean Durgasoff about what's going on with the Asian longhorned tick here in uh, North America. So the spread in the U.S. as well as what we're doing to try and prevent any kind of incursion into Canada. So we look forward to talking to you all again next week. Have a great week, stay safe, and remember to wash your hands. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff.